It is so good to see everyone here tonight. We're going to open up in prayer. I invite you to stand up, and then we're going to worship the Lord. Amen. How many of you came ready to worship the Lord? How many of you came ready to receive what He has for you tonight? His abundant blessings. Hallelujah. And go on and on.
so calm Move the dust and just roll on like a river Let it wash your tongue
carry, distracted by, entrapped maybe by, get tangled up in. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the liberator. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Liberty in who you are. And then in who you are in us as your children. Thank you. Thank you for your presence manifested in this place tonight. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Will you stay open to the Lord? Will you keep your heart spirit engaged with what he's wanting to do and say tonight? Amen. Can I hear one amen? Amen. amen. If you brought your tithe or offering to worship the Lord with, here's an opportunity to do that. Ushers are coming. If you need a giving envelope for receiving, give it. They can hand that off to you as they come. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. God is up to some good stuff. If you didn't get the memo, God's up to some good stuff. Maybe you didn't check your inbox lately. Maybe you somebody had your spiritual phone on silent. You didn't even feel the buzz, you know, the vibration. I'm telling you, God's up to some stuff. And I believe for all who say yes to him, God will be increasing in that. Amen. I want to just be set on yes. Multiple choice, let me just say yes in advance. Amen. God, we thank you for the provision that's come in our lives. Physical health, spiritual health, relational health, financial health. Thank you, Lord. You know where the jobs are needed, where increase is needed. Thank you for providing that. The needs are, you're the supply, yes. So, guys, if a direction is needed to put an application or put a step this way or that way, then give wisdom and favor there. And out of that, out of the increase that you give, obviously, that's we, we return to you. We thank you, Lord, for this seed sown tonight into the kingdom of God, taking it forward in Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. 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 Sure glad that you showed up on this Wednesday evening. I've got a word I really believe that the Lord had to just push me toward. It's an area I, I, I don't think I've ever preached on this, uh, um, what we're going to do tonight, the, 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 the chapter that I'm going to preach from tonight. But uh, as God kept nudging me, and I, I don't know what to say about this. Yeah. All the Word of God is good. Amen. But I, it's, it's kind of important that we get what God wants to get to us, you know, at the, at the moment. He knows, yeah. what, he knows what Thursday is going to look like. If he doesn't come, Jesus doesn't come back tonight, or we don't go to be with him tonight, he knows that. So I think he doesn't want to just prepare us for Thursday. I think word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept, is preparing us for our whole future. And again, it's not as a consumer thing just to keep it upon ourselves. He's, he's prepared us as distributors of truth and supposed to be examples of truth. And the only way that works is Him living big inside of us and us giving Him permission to do so. Tonight, the message is a call to worship. A call to worship in liturgical <laughs> churches that would probably be, okay, the first part is a call to worship, and we're going to do it. I, and I'm not knocking that. I just, sometimes, man, we need to hear God has really given us a call to worship. And it's not just, I don't want to, it's just, a call to worship is not just defined as the first part of the church service that we call praise and worship on the program or something. We really don't have a printed out program. It's not just that. So let me plow through a little ground before I get to the text tonight. Now, we live about 10 miles out in a, in a rural, mostly rural area, and a lot of farming goes on around where we where we live. But a very consistent part of successful farming is that the ground always undergoes preparation before the seeds are planted. You say, Pastor Ronnie, just give me your best shot. <coughs> I'm already tired, and I'm already getting a little bored, and you, you already talked about 60 seconds, and I, listen, I'm not here to give it my best shot. I want us to give what God's best shot is <laughs> to us for tonight. And part of it is God prepare, He prepares the soil of our hearts so we can receive the word. And I just felt like, let me, 
Let me use the farming analogy a little bit further because uh, as the soil preparation is undergone, part of it may be plowing. And I'm amazed at the huge equipment that, that runs up and down our the little road in front of our house and then in the fields around our house, all that. Uh, but it might be plowing. It might be spraying. I see that, that crop duster guy comes down. That's, a, that's just adventure or something. I go out and watch that on the... I, in the front yard, watch that guy just go so low, spray the field in one of the fields across from our house. Uh, maybe the nitrogen uh, injection, or whatever they do in the soil. All that stuff, whatever is proven most effective for the desired harvest. Now, in my brief soil preparation tonight, I want to consider a truth that I believe is foundational to a good understanding about worship. Some have referred to what I'm about to. Uh, used as the law of first mention. Anybody heard of that, the law of first mention? It's a reference made uh, for some. They would submit to us that the first time a word is mentioned in the Bible is significant to us understanding its usage in other places of Scripture as well. Now, I don't know if it's true enough to be called a law of first mention, but I think it's important enough for our topic tonight that I want to bring it out. The first place that the word in the Bible, worship, is used is found in Genesis 22, verse 5. We'll read that and without going deeply into it, but Genesis 22, verse 5, the first place in the entire word of God that the word worship is used, Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, somebody say worship. worship. We will worship and then we will come back to you. How many know the context, kind of the story surrounding that setting? Can I just see your hand? I'm talking to a Wednesday evening crowd, so it's a little different than a Sunday morning crowd. Many of you do. Abraham got a word from God that he was supposed to take his son, Isaac, and offer him on an altar of sacrifice to God. And God never has and never is into human sacrifice. But this, the Bible says in Genesis 22, verse 1, I think that God was testing Abraham. And he had a specific agenda. This was going to be an incredible prophetic picture. Let me go on with the stories. So God said, do this. Take your only son, Isaac, the son you love. And there was Ishmael, but that's another part of this. All that's another sermon for another time, pretty much. God will not allow Abraham to, to sacrifice his son. But he saw a willing heart that Abraham to obey God. And that was, that was huge. But if you know the, again, the story, God provided a ram to sacrifice in Isaac's place. That's where you find that word used, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provided himself. A sacrifice. Again, that whole scenario, you, you can read it later this week, Genesis chapter 22. The whole scenario is a beautiful prophetic portrayal of Jesus, the true Messiah, taking our place on the cross and then being raised from the dead. But Abraham said, the lad and I are going here to worship. I want to say that true worship, it, it's always wrapped up in obedience. True worship is wrapped up in obedience. I, I can go through the activity of singing Christian songs. I can go through the verbiage of praying. I can stand here and preach. I can witness. I can quote scripture. I, I can give. And I can do all of that without being in obedience in my life. I didn't know it was going to get so quiet so fast, but I just need to keep on. I can do those things, but I'm going to tell you, I can't truly really worship if I have set myself to embrace rebellion against God. If I have set myself in defiance against God, I can't truly really worship. Like I said, play, sing, give. Are y'all with me tonight? Abraham, because he obeyed God. He can truly say, Glad and I are going there, we're going to worship. Guess, and he and Glad came back, just like he 
prophetically said in that statement, and he, I don't want to go down, it's much, so much to be said in that whole message. Don't misunderstand when I say I can't worship truly if I'm embracing active rebellion or defiance against God. Don't misunderstand this, though. I don't mean that we have to arrive at some level of sinless perfection before we can come and worship the Lord. Please do not hear what I'm not saying tonight. But I believe that true worship is a response of our lives to God who will empower us to surrender and to walk in Holy Spirit empowered obedience. I know that's a long sentence, but can, you, you got it with me? True worship is a response of our lives to God who's going to empower us or surrender to walk in Holy Spirit empowered obedience. True worship in the last book of the Bible, Revelation, in the fourth chapter is where John, uh, I, I haven't seen that before, prepared for this message. Well, John walks into that open door in heaven. Hey, that's the name of this place we get it in. May this be, may this be an open door into the heavenly presence of God. But he said, it literally it says, quoting, a door standing open in heaven. Hallelujah. So John is ushered through that. He begins to describe what he sees. He sees the throne. He sees God on the throne. He describes the worship that was going on right there. Listen to this. Worship seems to be an eternal activity that's going on in heaven right now. But as we choose, we can participate in that worship from the earth side, even now. I believe some of you were tonight. You are intentional about it. Worshiping. Word. Man, I, I plowed a little longer already than I had sort of intended originally to plow, but I want to go back. The call to worship, uh, I want these seeds to be so planted in our spirits in order to bring forth a harvest for the glory of of God. I want to look at five verses of Scripture that actually comprise one song. This particular song is the only one that has its unique description, and it seems to be in the original Hebrew entirely of that song, and it, the title is A Song of Praise. And you may have thought, well, I thought most of the songs were songs of praise. This one is specifically entitled A Song of Praise. It is Psalms 100. Anybody familiar with Psalm 100? You've been around church very long. We, we'll quote it and just do different things. But like I said, I don't think I've ever preached about it. But I felt like God, had, that's what he called me to do tonight. So I'm going to try to share what I feel like he's put in my heart. I want us to read it together first. Psalms 100. I want you to read it out if you can see that uh, on the screen. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. Finally, verse 5 says to me, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endures to all generations. I'm already starting to feel better than I was feeling already. I thought I was feeling good already. Word of God in the right setting will enthuse us to embrace that obedience that he's done. So five things tonight or four or how many, many points I wound up with, something like that. Um, I'm going to just give you three, five things tonight. Let me go with you together. Number one, the context of our worship that's spoken about here, I believe is victory. The context of our worship is victory. Love what somebody said. I've said it before. We're in, in, in Jesus. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting in victory. Because, see, I, I, let me give it, I, I, I often want to provide supporting evidence that what I'm saying is true. So look at 1 Corinthians verse 15, 57, and say that again with me. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
not fighting for victory, I'm fighting in victory because through Jesus Christ, God gives us the victory. The word gives from the Greek uh, original language of the New Testament, it's present tense. It's active. It's a verb that God gives. When does it give? Yesterday and I ran out. <laughs> tomorrow, but not to tomorrow yet. No, it's present tense. That means right now. On a Wednesday evening, when stuff has come against you today, when you're thinking about a little bread for something tomorrow, God, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory, ongoing gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I just couldn't stop there. Verse 58. It's kind of one of those verses that say, say something about me, say something about me, because I, I really just want to stop with the one. But 58, the city says, Therefore, because God gives us the victory, therefore, my beloved brethren, sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Lord, we give God praise. Just for a minute. What? Thank you. Thank you. That I, you, you are the one that makes our labor not in vain in you. And those that are even tired in the spirit realm or in their soulless realm, that tonight would be a night of refreshing. As you said, since we're in victory and we're fighting in victory, therefore we know to be steadfast, immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that our labor is not in vain in you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 1 of Psalms 100. Let's break it down. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Now, for those who cannot sing, Austin, but for those that, that say that out loud, oh, excuse me. Uh, for those that cannot sing, this is a verse of hope and of, of effectiveness for you. Make a joyful noise. Okay. I've heard him sing. I know. <laughs> I'm messing. I can do that because he's my son. Uh, but uh, I, should, I should slack up a, a little bit maybe. Listen, really, that means who in this room can make a joyful noise to the Lord? Everybody. Everybody. So we can take hold of that. I, the old timers used to say, well, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. I get it. But you can make a joyful noise to the Lord. And really, let's go back. And, in the original Hebrew, the word translated noise, it can mean to shout in triumph. It, it's a Hebrew word that can mean to shout in applause or to shout for joy. It can also mean a war cry. Or a sound, or a signal for war, or to march. Amen. Make a joyful shout to God with the voice. All, all, I'm getting the other Corinthian scripture tied in with it. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all your lands. He wasn't just talking to, as he's writing to the Hebrews. This is a prophetic word too, because it's uh, uh, Old Testament points to Jesus and to a, uh, every nation coming to Him. Make a joyful shout to God, all your lands, all your peoples. I believe that we who are, who are Jesus followers ought to be the ones obeying this command. Lord, thank you for an eternal and ultimate victory that we can find in you. That, that ought to stir us up to make a joyful shout to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Number two, one aspect of our worship is serving. It's serving. In this serving, it's not though as this is some drudgery or some grueling duty, God goes serve God. Listen, let me remind you of something. If you're serving in a ministry of, of the church, and whether it be food pantry or ushering or teaching in kids' church or working with youth or worship team, I want to make sure that you know this. You are not serving me doing that. You're not serving a building doing that. We're serving the Lord. Out of that serving, that's part of my worship. When nobody's looking at you, pick up that piece of paper that was on the floor. You're doing that as unto the Lord. You know what I'm saying? I, I just don't. It, it's not supposed to be a grueling duty. And it, it's not forced slavery under the hand of some harsh tyrant. 
Look at Psalms 100 verse 2. Serve the Lord with what? With gladness. Say it again. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. The word gladness in the Hebrew it means with joy or with pleasure. See, He equips us and He empowers us so that we can be rightly motivated. See, I grew up in a, in a really kind of a religious culture, church culture. People who love God and, and those things. I'm so thankful for a godly heritage. But the tendency was toward an external uh, legalism or an external uh, outward end thing. And, and sometimes people be so... I, I, I don't, I'm not saying some people that attend here can't be that way either, but it, do, it, it doesn't need to be you tonight or any other night. There's, there's just a grumpy, grouchy Christian. I got the joy of the Lord. Mm. Wow. I got all the trouble I need. I better stay over here because you got No, he says, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Don't be grumpy because you're coming. And it, oh, man, I don't want to go far down the road. I'll, I'll use one illustration. I think it'll help us in a minute. But what I got reflecting on when I was thinking about this, with serving the Lord with gladness, it, it's, it's, he's empowered us to serve readily and cheerfully and willingly. Serving the Lord with gladness. When I reflect on when uh, Pastor Kim and I were dating, uh, and probably more specifically when we were recording, uh, looking toward marriage, and I, I was working a pretty demanding physical job then during that time. And I was also volunteering and helping to build a church, a church building during all that time too. After working all day, all that stuff, and, and, and then working at the church building, and then I was still anxious to drop by and see her, to visit with her, to talk with her. She was living with her brother and his family, so, but I could still often go by there. But see, my motivation, my love for her, kept it from being some dutiful, begrudging act. Oh, I've got to go by there because she's going to really be upset if I don't show up. I guess I've got to... I'll go anyway. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> mm, no, I wanted to see her. I still want to see her. 36 years later, I still want to see her. And I, Oh, we can't let you get announced. It's not nearly as much trouble as going by after work and <laughs> all that. But doing that during that 26 years ago, I mean, when, when I'm thinking of this in this respect, uh, I, I get, I, even though I was tired, I was dirty, probably didn't smell all that good either. And it, it probably didn't hurt that at that time I had a 26 year old level of energy too, because that's how old I was. But when, when I talk about being rightly motivated and serving the Lord with gladness, what we do out of love for Him, it's not a burden anymore. Can you get tired doing ministry? Be honest. Yes, you can. And, and what can happen, hmm, we need to do some evaluation at times. If my serving with gladness has diminished, I need to sometimes just let the Lord help me fall back in love with Him again. Oh, yeah. I love it. People just get come to the Lord. Sometimes they'll say, I wish we had church seven days a week. I wish I could be here all the time. I wish, can, is there something I can do? And then if you're not careful, school push back. Uh, Sunday night. Uh, uh, Wednesday, when well, you're here somewhere, I don't have to preach to you all over here. Uh, if we find ourselves settling into being burned out as believers, then I, I want to pull out an illustration that kind of used some years ago or in, in some facet, probably different than this, but we had a, in the several years ago, maybe about nine years ago, I don't remember, uh, someone from the church uh, sent him and I to Israel. It was a wonderful experience. And, 
And one of the things that they gave us was one of these oil lamps. I think it was in the city of Nazareth where they, they gave us these. And this, this simple oil lamp, it, it made out of pottery, and I don't think it's been fired. It's pretty delicate. It's falling apart in my hand, but I'm not going to let that happen. But it had a wick in it, and you'd fill it up with, with olive oil, with oil that was common in the era, and, and light that, that candle. Um, and with that little wick that's there and drawing from the oil, it, it by a natural reaction of all this process, the oil sucks up through the wick, and when you ignite it, the light keeps burning. It burns the oil that keeps drawing from that up the wick. Everybody kind of know that? So what will happen, though, if you let the lamp run out of oil, then it starts burning the wick. No, I don't smoke, but I found one of these somewhere. <laughs> if, you, if you let the oil run out, and I, I didn't fill this enough with oil because I didn't want to make a mess like I have before. You see something? Do y'all see something when this wick is burning and there's no oil in there? What do you see? Smoke. Smoke. When we start operating out of our own ability and we run out of oil and we don't let him fill up fill us up with oil we start burning the wick and I think that's the point when people get burned out and I want to tell you, burned out people that are just doing, going through motions I mean this smoke if I get it in the right place it's going to burn my nose and make my eyes water put that out man. there it is that whole church on fire right there. Okay. What I'm saying is, if we're not careful and, and we're not letting God fill us up, this thing just keeps burning. <laughs> but I got it this time. What, what will happen is that we become a smoke to those without us. And if you hear smoke coming out of your mouth, I don't mean cigarette smoke, I mean, I mean ugly stuff. And you hear criticism and you hear harshness and judgmentalism coming out of your mouth. Can I just suggest that if I see those things in me, I need to make sure my, my lamp is getting some more oil in it. Because I can go through the motions and I can do church. Oh, Lord, don't let us just be stuck doing church. Let us have the relational flow of His presence. And the light that comes out, not let it, not let it be my wick burning that irritates those around me with, with the smoke and the fume, but let it be the oil, because the oil, when that lamp is working properly, the oil will produce light. And wherever you go, it's going to produce light. It's going to be covered. I'm saying, if we will let the Holy Spirit so fill us up, I don't mean you'll never get tired. I don't mean that sometimes people won't get on your nerves. I'm just telling you that the oil of God will burn on through that stuff. Amen. Amen. I can say it by experience. I can both my own and others. Lord, fill us up full of the oil of the Holy Spirit and burn through us with light and with usefulness. Amen. Serve the Lord with gladness, he said. Number three is our worship is to be based on our relationship with him. See, he's not some distant deity that we made up. He's not a generic power, higher power or doorknob or whatever. God, he is God who is revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 100 verse 3, say it with me. Know that the Lord. I'll pause. But Psalms 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. You ever heard that old saying that somebody describes in a kind of arrogant way? Well, I'm a self-made man. Y'all ever heard that before? You're not old enough to know. I'm just telling you it was a saying back then. I, I'm a self-made man. And somebody ought to respond to them and say, well, you should be ashamed of what you made. Just straighten up. I don't know what's up with you. But the, the truth is that God will... God said, it's he who has made us. The psalmist said, it is God. He is God. It's he who's made us, not we ourselves. Let's look at verse 3 
from the New Living Translation, a knowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. I like that. I like that. His creation. His sheep, His pasture. I'm going to promise you this, that God will take care of what's His. Ah, confidence. John chapter 10 is another thing we had to read this this week, maybe. But John chapter 10, Jesus makes it really clear that He is the good shepherd. Ah, we're his sheep, sheep of his pasture, but Jesus declares himself as the good shepherd. John 10, 27, he made a, a descriptive statement about sheep, his sheep. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If we're not following, we're probably not a sheep, but we can become a sheep. And we're not listening we, he can start opening our ears where we can hear. Again, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. See, when I like what somebody said. Uh, it said, when you can't sleep, don't count sheep. Y'all heard that, seen that saying, count sheep, one, two. Here's some jumping over the fence, whatever. Don't count sheep. Talk to the shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. Shall not want. Could, uh, if we aren't. I have never seen this in Psalms 100 before, but I'll share it with you. It says, we are the sheep of his pasture. To me, that indicates that if we're in his pasture, we're supposed to be in a right relationship with other sheep in the pasture, too. Sure quiet on this Wednesday night. There's sheep in the pasture of God in Waco, Texas, that don't go to church of the open door. There are sheep that see some things that, that are in churches that are that, that have some differences that, that as far as lining up fully with every nuance of theology that I believe the Bible teaches, they might not. But they're loving Jesus, they're receiving Jesus, Savior and Lord, and God's changing, uh, filling people. I, I just think we need to learn how to get along with sheep in the, in the pasture because it says that we're the sheep of his pasture. They're not my sheep. We're his sheep. We're all sheep. Look over at somebody and say, ah. <laughs> Y'all are cooperating good on Wednesday night. Thank you. <laughs> if we are not relating in love with other sheep in the pasture, God help us. God help me. I told you before, I was both religious and mean. Religiously mean. Growing up and Things of God, we a lot of scripture and stuff like that, but I didn't properly always relate because I mean, our little world was probably that 50 or 60 people, maybe that was part of the church I grew up in, didn't know a lot about what else was going on in the church world. But I could sure throw judgments against it. Now, I'm not talking about not being able to judge right and wrong. We shouldn't do that. The Bible says sin is sin, and we can, we can say that same thing. But harsh judgmentalism. Spirits, that wasn't appropriate. I hurt people. I, I don't want to hurt people anymore. I want to help people. Amen? Yeah. If you're feeling that same way for yourself. Jesus said in verse 11, John 10 and 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. See, if Jesus loves his sheep that much, should we love his sheep too? Yeah. Amen. God help us to love sheep. Even sheep that are of this fold. Amen. Number four, our worship is coming into his presence. Our real worship is us coming into his presence. We're still in Psalms 100, but God's laid out an incredible invitation right here. And it really could be viewed as a command appropriately as well, but it's Psalms 100, verse 4. Say it with me. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his course with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Now let me, do, let me jump around just for a moment here for some clarification. That first word where, uh, of Psalms 100 verse 4, the Hebrew word that's translated enter here, enter into his gates, it's the same one that's translated come back in verse 2. Let's glance at that. Psalms 100, verse 2, come before his presence 
Back to verse 2, the second part, if you find that. It says, come before his presence with singing. Again, we are to be people of his presence. Can I hear one amen? amen. We're not to be people of just uh, right thinking, good theology, good order, clean living. We ought to be all those things. Amen. But we need his presence. Come into his presence. See that command? Come before his presence. The word presence from the Hebrew, it means the face. It means the face. Come before the face of God. He, and the invitation is there. The command is come. Listen, here's the beautiful part. And, and that through what Jesus has done, we have access into the presence of God. And through, his pre and, and through Jesus, his presence has access into us too. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's by us coming into his presence, submitting and yielding to him, that he changes us. There's a wonderful promise. Maybe you can go slip back up to the keyboard. appreciate it. Look at this wonderful promise. It's foretold in the Old Testament. Real similar wording is found in Jeremiah to, again, God was, was foretelling what would happen in the New Covenant, even from a perspective of the Old Covenant. But two verses, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, verse 26, God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will take out of you a heart of flesh, remove the heart of stone, I mean. He said, I will remove or take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Look at verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. Somebody say, within you. Within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. That word cause is so powerful. God said, I put my spirit in you and I will cause you. That word in Hebrew, it means I, to produce or to make or to prepare. By his spirit in you, brother and sister. By his spirit in us, he's producing something in us. He's preparing something in us. He's making something in us. I found that same word, that same Hebrew word, is found in Psalm 100, verse 3, that we read a few moments ago. It's he who has, what? Made us. That's that same Hebrew word. It's he who's made us. It's he who has put his spirit on the inside of us and is still making us ongoing. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 10 for a moment. And for we are, say it with me if you can see it, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the word workmanship is almost the same. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, that's the, it's the same word that's translated. I know it's jumbled up right there probably, but same, same word that translated workmanship, poema. We're God's creation. He made us. We are His. He has created us, not we ourselves. And He's working us. Don't think that we ourselves can change this stuff in here either. Because it's by His Spirit. Ah, uh, by the Spirit of the Lord. Is it first or second Corinthians 3? By the Spirit of the Lord, we're translated, transferred, transformed from glory to glory. Guys, God wants us moving on from faith to faith, glory to glory, being transformed from old Ronnie to newer Ronnie. God helping me not be that, that, mm. look, at, look at Psalms 100 verse 4 one more time. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Come, come in, come in. Enter the gates. With thanksgiving, thanksgiving, it, it's the Hebrew word that means an extension of the hand. Hallelujah. I don't know, it just feels so natural to me. 
We're in here going to worship God. My hands just want to go up. He said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. It won't hurt my feelings if you walk in that front door and say, hallelujah. If you write, but an extension of the hand is really a picture of surrender, isn't it? Lord, enter his gates with surrender. Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you, Lord. Help us. That can really be the case. And he says, enter his courts with praise. Keep entering his courts with praise. The root of that word, that's the Hebrew noun that it's translated from the verb of that is halal, where we get hallelujah. It is that radical praise. Enter his courts with praise. It's not the subdued little praise. It's an out loud voice for singing. And he, so he said, I, I, I don't want to say it this way. Keep on entering into his gates with thanksgiving. Keep on entering into his courts with praise. Keep on being thankful to him and bless his name. That particular word literally means to kneel. To kneel. Now, we may not can all physically kneel. That is becoming increasingly more difficult for me. But to kneel in my heart, that's where I need to keep posture. My posture ought to always be kneeling here. I don't mean it in a weird way. I just mean to submit it to it. Hallelujah. Let me give you this last point before I close. Number five is our worship is based on who God is, not on feelings, emotions, or circumstances. Hallelujah. Mm. If, let me take you to the word, but God, our worship is based on who he is. The last verse of Psalms 100 is verse 5. Say it with me again if you can. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Now he's already said, enter his gates this way, do this, do this, do this. And finally the last, the concluding verse, he says, For because the Lord is good, that's a good description of God. We serve a good God. Amen. The Lord is good. And his mercy is everlasting. That is that Hebrew word hased. Uh, it, the word translated mercy. It means the loving kindness. It, many times in the uh, Bible it's translated loving kindness. But it means the goodness and the kindness and the faithfulness of God. All that's wrapped up in one word. So he said his mercy is everlasting. The goodness of God. Kindness of God. And the faithfulness of God is everlasting. His steadfastness, and it says his truth endures to all generations. That literally means steadfastness or steadiness. Keep coming into his presence. Keep letting his presence transform us. Because he's not waking up one day and I wonder if God's good today. I, I wonder if God's going to be kind today. That's the character. That's who he is. Out of that that we come. We keep coming into his presence. The only way to come is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's really important. Because if I think I'm going to come there in my own goodness, Lord, I gave a little, I gave above my time this week. Lord, I helped a really old lady across the street, older than me. I just have, my God, if that's some goodness that's going to merit me, <laughs> merit me something. No, no, no. Good works ought to flow out of who he is in us. I'm not telling you don't do good stuff. You should. But it flows out of here. And then it's with the right motive. It's right, the right heart. Only way is through Jesus. One last familiar verse. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You don't come through an open door membership. You don't come through an association that, that sets you some way apart. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, if you're here, not walking with Jesus yet, and you haven't made that decision, I want you to be able to. Tonight, if you're here, what you realize is you've been burning the wick, and it's really getting worn down. I'd like you to stand up with me all across the room, not just the worn out ones. <laughs> but I want us to stand up together. I want prayer partners to come. Listen, because uh, there's lots of levels of comfort whether people feel extreme on social 
social distancing, you know, oftentimes in your physical condition, I don't want to press anybody to do and what you're you're uncomfortable with in that area. Not you want to wear a mask, we're okay with that. You don't want to, we're okay with that. You want to come up closer, it's okay. I'm just saying these these prayer partners for this time, they're okay for you to come. If you feel okay, we want somebody to pray with you in agreement. If you want to, as Becky gave the invitation earlier, you're welcome to just come and be up here. You can kneel at this front. You can kneel at this, these, these prayer places. We're entering this gate. But see what's going on in here is, is what takes priority over a physical posture or position that you're in. But often what I need, my body, my my soulish realm, may, I may not feel like worshiping God. Y'all ever come into this place and not feel like worshiping God? My hand was up first. You know, maybe you had a lot of stuff happening, kids on the rampage before you got to church, busting with your husband, wife, whatever. You come in, don't, don't let your worship be contingent on the end of that. Say, I'm just saying, well, maybe you're fussing with your dog. I don't know, your cat or something. But whatever it is that, I'm just saying, let's be on purpose and intentional about worship with God, not just in the building of in our lives. But if you've been burning the wick and the wall is kind of, like, can we just take a little bit and worship God very intentionally? He said it would come to those that believe on him. He said, out of your out of your spirit comes a well of water springing up to everlasting life. That was salvation. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. A well of water springing up, a spring of water. And, and John Sabbath, when he talked about baptism and the Holy Spirit, he said, it's going to be like a river of water flowing out. And we just worship God. Whether you want to sing the words of a song they're going to do or not, I just don't want you to get distracted. Take about five minutes, would you? We can do this it's for those that are taking medications. 8.15. I'm, I'm kidding about that. I don't think we're so smart about tonight. It just seems to be happening. What I want to say. Listen, I, I love you guys. And I, I don't want the enemy to be able to take advantage of. Sometimes a distraction. Sometimes something that got into feelings mode so much and it's just controlling you so much that they you let you all that kind of drive. And sometimes when I've been disobedient to God, when I've missed it with God, and instead of running to it, God, God I acknowledge this, forgive me. And I'm going to just kind of excuse my, make excuses to justify that that will cause some oil flow to get shut off in my life. And then I just need to so tonight, if you, what you need to do is just between you and God, God forgive me for this area right here. God, and I take your grace to overcome now. I take your power in. Again, come in. He said, in interest in us. Come into this court. People of his presence. Lord, hmm, not necessarily another sermon, but what we want right now is the power of your presence.